Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. How are you doing today? If you can, as everyone is streaming in, if you can hear me, please let me know. I see some responses, so I think that the sound seems to be okay. Hey, Kalyan. Hey, Dan. How are you doing? Thanks, Derek. All right, so one thing I like to do as we give it a minute or two before everyone else jumps in is, you know, let me know. Where are you joining me from? I would, I always love to find out where is everyone joining me from. So let's see, where are you coming from? Hey. Good stuff. Wow. <coughs> Reaching out to all around the world. Hey, Richard, how are you doing? Hey, Joseph. Good stuff. Good stuff. India, Philippines, London, Johor Bahru. Fantastic. All right. So are you ready to get started? Keep it coming. I want to see where's everyone joining us from. And if you're ready to get started, let me know as well. Let's say get, let's get ready to go. So today we are going through is one of the ultimate Forex trading masterclass. I will be going through some um, live trading analysis together with you. This will work best if you um, participate. So let me know if, if you have any questions, if you've got any charts that you'd like me to look at, um, you know, any, anything that you'd like to find out more about in terms of trading, uh, please let me know. I'll be happy to share with you my thoughts, my experiences, uh, my views as well. Hey, Mr. Green, how are you doing? <coughs> All right. So one last minute before we get started, just a quick this well, quick point as well as I'm coughing a little bit. So bear with me if I jump into a bit of a coughing fit. <coughs> All righty. So everyone's good to go. Let's get started. Today we are here with the Kuala Lumpur. Kuwait. Okay, today we are here with um, the Tick Mill doing the Tick Mill Ultimate Forex Trading Masterclass. As you would be familiar, for those of you, I see a lot of familiar names. Um, if you're joining us, this is recorded. This will be uploaded. I have a question there about previous recordings. Um, please check, I think, either the YouTube or um, I'll figure out how to get it sent out to you guys as well. So this is recorded. If you missed any of the sessions, you know, check back, check back. And, you know, sometimes as we do live trading sessions, if you missed it, might not be, um, it'd be good to check back, but it's more about moving forward, right? Because we are talking about what could happen to the markets, uh, what could happen moving forward. So... As usual, a quick disclaimer before we get started. Um, I will be looking at the markets. I will be looking at the charts. I will be looking at some news, potential news, and have share with you my thoughts, my views, my opinions. So remember that any material provided is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, information, or opinions expressed in this webinar is solely that of the author myself and not of the author's employer organization committee or other group or individual or company. Basically, what it means is that as I share with you some thoughts, some possible trades that I might be jumping into, please do your own due diligence. Uh, please make sure you check your charts, uh, check your risk sizing, check your risk management because you know from my experience is that Traders don't really lose that badly um, on a strategy, right? On any strategy. Traders lose really badly when they can't manage their risk, when they're over leveraging or over trading. So that's crucial. Do your own due diligence before you jump into any trade. We can't be responsible for your trades um, or for any trades that you jump into. With that, hey everyone, how are you doing? All right. Um, quick. Introduction of myself. My name is Jin Dao. Everyone knows me as Jin. So, you know, 
if moving forward, if I take on any other sessions, you know me already. Um, I am one of the traders and one of the researchers here to help you through this or to guide you through this live trading session. All right, we just had a big news. Put it into the chat. Do you know what was the big news we had? Today is Monday. What was the big news we had on Friday evening last week? Or our Friday evening GMT plus eight last week. What was the last? What was the big news? Dan with the quick answer, John with the quick answer. Fantastic. So it was the NFP. And was it a good news or bad news, Dan and John? Was it a good news or bad news? Let's take that away. Good for the dollar. Yes, it was good for dollar. Hey, you guys are forgetting as well. We did not just have the NFP. We had something else. What else was the other news we had? It was lovely news. All right, so just doing a quick recap. It was not just the NFP news we had. This was Friday last week on the 5th of August. GMT plus eight, we had the... At 8.30 p.m., we had the Canadian employment numbers together with the U.S. employment numbers. So, you know, jumping straight into it, um, U.S. non-farm payroll, non-farm employment change there, came out more than double the expectations, more than double expectations. It was 372, it got revised slightly to the upside of 398. Expected a little bit of a modest view no modest expectation at 250k but then what we saw was a 528k being released in terms of non-farm payroll average hourly earnings for the us as well right it was 0.3 got revised upwards to 0.4 expected to stay at 0.3 but it got re released at a 0.5 and unemployment rate for the us dropping slightly from a 3.6 to a 3.5%. So all in all, what you should have seen was this was good US data, good US data. We saw almost immediate downward move um, across the board. We saw the dollar strengthen across the board. But like CISO is saying here, um, it wasn't, it moved down, <coughs> right? The dollar strengthened, but it didn't strengthen, it wasn't a sustained move. It shot up and then it sat right across, retraced a little bit. A lot of the pairs shot down or shot in a direction in one move and then sat in consolidation or retraced a little bit. So this makes um, the trading of the news a little bit more tricky. And I'll show you what I mean when we look at the charts. <clears throat> With that, at the same time, 8.30, we also had the Canadian unemployment rate was 4.9, expected to jump slightly to 5, but it stayed at 4.9. So no change on unemployment rate for the Canadians, but employment change number actually was not as good as expected, right? It was a minus 43,000, expected a plus 14, but what we actually saw was a minus 30.6. So we actually saw the Canadian dollar weaken, or the Canadian dollar weaken a little bit, especially against the US dollar, because at that news, um, the Canadian dollar was at the same time being released with the US. So what you would gather here as well, before I go further or move further on, is that <clears throat> the way I approach the charts or the way I approach my trading is that I look at first the news, right? I always consider the news first. I always think about, how markets could move in terms of the news before I look into the charts. So I look at, hey, dollar should strengthen, dollar should push higher. Then I look into the charts to see, is dollar pushing higher, right? If it does, great, I'll jump into a trade. If not, then I will look into um, a possible waiting or possible short-term counter trend trade idea. So this is how I always look at it. First, fundamentals, and I approach it a little bit differently compared to a lot of other traders I've seen. Um, I do consider fundamentals a little bit more. And then after that, I look into the charts. I tend to prefer trend following trades rather than counter trend, although I know that counter trend trades will or could give you a good 
uh, risk to reward, but I kind of like trend following trades first. Then after that, we look into um, any possible counter trends. And then are my support and resistance lines to tell me you know, when to get in or whether there's a breakout happening or a break or breakout of a consolidation. All right. So right off, any questions here from anyone? Any questions? Any particular pair you would love for me to look into first? Anything? Anything? Oil. Okay, so I'll do, so it's the first one was oil, but um, question here is why didn't the price follow the news? Let's look into the news first, all right? So this is the dollar index on the H1 time frame. What you can see here was that it actually did follow the news. Um, this is the dollar index at the news release. This was at eight o'clock. The news was released at 8.30. So when the news got released, <coughs> hey, Desiree, how are you doing? All right. As the news got released, we saw the dollar index bounce off quite strongly off this 105, about 105.90 level, shot straight towards the upside. All right. Shot straight towards the upside. And then it retraced back down, now trying to push back up again. So it's not that it didn't follow the news. Um, actually did, right? It was good US data, dollar strengthened, pushed towards the upside. Why did it come back in? Several reasons. One, if I zoom out, you can see that on my previous analysis, um, there was the downward channel, right? The downward channel. And then you can see that as price broke out of the channel, what had to happen, a little bit of a technical play there. As price broke out, it came back in and bounced to test that lower end of the channel to test, to bounce back up towards upside again, all right? It is now ready for a fib retracement, all right? So it looks like it's pushing higher, especially, you know, my view here is that it's found that support that has went up, came back down, found a support at this channel. <coughs> so this resistance now seems to be forming a bit of a support level now. We're looking for that push towards upside. So um, straight away, it did follow the news. Um, as we look into the charts, Aussie dollar during that news at eight o'clock, we did see the Aussie dollar drop lower very strongly. It went from that 6950 all the way down, but it has retraced back up. Why did it retrace back up? I went to the H4 time frame. I'll show you here that I'll put a line across. You can see that it tested. This line was held in 25th of July, came close on the 3rd of August, tested on the 5th of August with the news. And if I did drag this right across, you can see that it's held this 6.9, about 6.9 level quite strongly. Again, in the 5th of July, further back, again in June and further back, oops, further back, thereabouts again in the 15th of June. So this is why I pair it up, right? I look at first the fundamentals. Hey, dollar should strengthen. Things should be coming, or Aussie dollar, pound dollar, all these should be coming towards the downside. Looking at the trend, zoom it out. Hey, it's on a downtrend, short term up. But looking at the support resistance, it needs to clear below this 6.9 level, 0 0.69 level. It needs to break lower. And in the extreme end, it needs to break below 6868 before I would be very confidently selling it towards the next downside or even 6716. That does mean that, however, you could still be trading during that news event, right? You could still be trading during that news event, short term trade towards that support level, wait it out. Don't expect it to break. You know, you don't expect support levels to break. You think that it's going to um, hit and bounce. So it came towards that point where it hits and bounces off. Um, and that's why we saw price of the Aussie dollar and it pretty much across the board drop strongly, hit a support level and bounce towards the upside. All right. So I hope that 
answers your question there or everyone else's question. Um, if you were just thinking, why didn't price follow the news? It actually did, right? It did, but not sustained. It did, but not sustained. Why is it not sustained? Because again, back to Forex Factory here, looking at the news, <coughs> it's very strong data. It's very strong data for employment, but we're still looking at inflation growing. We're still looking at inflation. This is wage inflation, right? Getting paid more, wage inflation is still growing, which is still going to be a concern for the US. If, infl if wage inflation is growing, if inflation in general is still growing, then we're going to look at dollar or the Fed Reserve pumping more interest rates or hiking interest rates further, which could further cause a recession. Right now, Fed members are saying, no, we're not in a recession, everything's okay. But if they continue increasing rates, if in September, instead of doing a 50 basis point, they did a 75 off, they did a 100 basis point, we're going to see that risk of recession getting worse and worse. So that's one reason why we saw that big drop, but then it stayed it off and bounced back up again. What we are looking at or could consider is a retrace back down again. <coughs> All right, so, so far so good. Let me know if it's okay. Oh, wait, uh, I've got one guy who can't hear. Can everyone else hear me? If you can hear me, let me know. If you can't, then um, put your... Okay, good, good, good. If you can't, then maybe try and check your audio setting. I think you might need to connect via audio. <coughs> All right, so coming straight, let's look at some charts now. <coughs> Oil, Brent, All right? First one, Brent. Uh, my view previously, I was looking for it to test that 101 level to trade lower didn't test as high as I expected, test a little bit before dropping. Let me clear this out so I can show you straight away on the H4 time frame. This is one, a few key points you need to take note of. On Brent, the key level right now is at 69660, right? We've seen it come down, hit this level, bounce back up, test again, bounce back up, and it seems like it's approaching again. I still do think we're going to see some downside on Brent. We're going to see some downside, but <coughs> this is a very, very strong level. Right? <clears throat> it's a very strong support level. Why do I say so? Because if I zoomed out, you can see that. Oh, wait, I'm put on a daily time frame and pull that line right across. You can see that the last time it <clears throat> tested this level was in February this year. Tried to break higher, resisted, tried to break, and then it bounced back up. Came very close in March. Not so within the region in April. Again, bounced off in July. And right now in August, we're at that same level again. Looking, looking for it to break down, right? Looking for it to break down. I would not be looking to sell unless I'll be a very risk adverse here. I would be looking to sell only if it clears below that nine five level. So let me just drag this line down towards nine five, right? Nine four, nine five. Only if it clears below this point, then I would say that, hey, we're going to likely see more sustained move towards the downside. How far down? could Brent go, <clears throat> you can see that the next key point is about 86, at about 86, right? So that's the next key point where you saw it test and reject, test and bounce off. So if we see it drop, we're looking for that downward move, right? That's why I would have given it a bit more space to look for that strength to break towards the downside before I would look for 86. What could cause Brent to drop, right? What could cause Brent to drop? Two things, further um, concerns or further risk or further worries about recession. Because as a recession continues to um, worry investors, 
demand is going to drop, right? So we're going to see likely if demand drops, we're going to see price drop as well. Or if OPEC comes out and says that, hey, they're going to increase production levels. They have already come out and said that they might increase. In the most recent OPEC meeting, they said they might have a small increase. That's why we saw that drop. If we do see them increase production levels, we're going to see oil break below that 9.5 level towards the 8.6 level. <clears throat> but I think that um, this area might hold quite strong. This area, oops, this area might hold quite strong. Um, I would be a little bit careful if you're looking to trade towards the downside, right? So watch out for that fake breaks, watch out for the quick bounce. I would say you know, look for it to break below that 9.5 level before looking to sell it towards the downside. All right. So far, so good. All right. I got a few questions on Euro dollar. I will get to Euro dollar one second. What's 10.4? 10, 10 out of 4. All right. Um, so going through the list, we did all Swiss franc. Where is my Swiss franc? US, Swissy, Swissy. All right. So look at that. I love that. I was looking for it to drop. Let's look at an H4 time frame. I was looking for it to drop. It hit that. I was looking for a bounce at that resistance level. It did drop halfway before bouncing back up. <coughs> Take that away. At this point, watch out. Big round number there. 9600 0. 0. 0.9600 is a big round number. We saw this push towards upside because of that dollar strength. We saw this retrace back down. Right now, I'm looking for this to let me take this away. Right now, I'm looking for this to come back in, right? To come back into that range. So I think it's going to bounce in this level. No, no big news, no surprises on the Swiss franc at this point. We did see that the inflation data for the Swiss is slowing down. Inflation growth is slowing down. So unlikely, unlikely that we'll see the Swiss National Bank surprise with another interest rate hike. So I think that we might see it bounce around. If the dollar continues to strengthen, then it needs to break above this point, right? We saw this as a very strong resistance, 9630. So about a 9630 before I would think of further upside. At this point, I think that there are a lot of better trades. You know, I would pay attention to better trades than jump onto the Swissy, the US Swiss franc. Any idea why? Any idea why I would prefer... Um, other trades rather than trying to buy the US Swiss franc towards upside. I'll show you the whole chart. I'll show you almost the whole chart here. Have a quick guess. Why do I why would I prefer to you know trade other pairs rather than the US Swiss franc? <coughs> <coughs> Very good, Liam. Very good. You almost read my mind. It's like reading my mind. Um, it is on the downtrend. So if I did look to buy it towards the upside, could it could happen, but it will be a counter trend. You know, like I was telling you at the start, <clears throat> I do prefer um, a bit more of a trending scenario. So what I would actually be looking for is whether price could climb and turn down. <clears throat> So if I, I would be looking for a reaction at that point of 9680, six, <clears throat> then I would rather sell it down towards the downside. In this case, I'll be looking at a trade like that. So about a 30 pips stop loss at about 9666. I would have a 60 pips towards the downside, towards that support level. Right, that would be a one is to two risk reward ratio towards the downside. And if that happens, you can see it happens quite quickly back in July. The next trade will be if it breaks below that level again towards the downside. <clears throat> so, so US Swiss franc, I would rather sit and wait 
before looking to jump into a counter trend trade or rather let it react and trade towards the downside. Okay. A lot of people asking for pound dollar. <clears throat> Not usually one of the big favorites on the pound dollar um, in terms of questions. This was an analysis I did for <coughs> the pound. Um, what was it? Let me just check. There was a news there. So the interest rate decision. <coughs> So on Thursday last week, the Bank of England actually increased interest rates in the UK by 50 basis points. They went from a 1.25% to a 1.75%, right? They increased interest rates. What would you normally expect if, um, given that the Bank of England had increased interest rates, should the pound dollar get stronger or weaker? I know what you're gonna say. Right. Typically, what we would expect is for the pound dollar to get stronger as interest rates increases. But if you read into the summary and the report, you notice that although nine members voted to increase rates, right? the first number is how many members voted to increase. If you went into the details, eight members actually voted to increase by 50 basis points, and one member actually voted to increase by 25 basis point, right? So that's one, one of the reasons why we saw a reverse reaction. And also because um, I won't find, I can't find it there, but in the statement in the report, it was said that they anticipated inflation in the UK to reach 15% by 2023, right? So Although they are look, they're increasing rates and they've been the first ones to increase rates and now they're doing 50 basis point rate increase. They're still, Bank of England is still projecting that inflation is likely to increase to 15% in 2023. And because of that, we saw the pound dollar, this was during the news, shoot towards the downside <coughs> quite strongly hit that 1.2066 level before bouncing back up again. All right, so if you did that trade, great. <coughs> we saw the um, non-farm payrolls bring it lower again, now retracing back up. So my view here on the pound dollar, take these lines away just to clarify things, is that if I put this line right across, no, this line 1.2050 is my line there. All right, put that line across, that's the support level. That was a resistance, was a resistance, support, support, and also support area there. So that's why we see the pound dollar bouncing back up. What I actually think might happen is, like some of you have commented already, oh, where are all my lines? All right, I'll take that away first, all right? Uh, we've actually seen the pound dollar drop. I think what will happen is we're likely to see this bounce back up before turning back down again. Nothing to do yet on the pound dollar. I'm looking for it to break below that line. I'm looking for it to break below that support level for a possible move towards the downside. I don't think it will get to that 1.18 level, right? I think first it needs to come and test 1.1930 or about, about that point, 1.1920. So for those of you who are looking at a trade, this is what I would be looking at. Uh, I'm monitoring the pound dollar. I'm looking for a rejection of the upside. I'm looking for it to turn down. A safe, my, my safe entry would be at about below 1.2020. Stop loss about a 50 pips. Take profit about 100 towards that 1.1920. You're looking at a one is to two risk reward ratio towards the downside, right? So I do want it or I do need it to break below that recent low point. So it needs to break below that recent low point 
before I'll be looking to sell it towards the downside. All right. It's pound dollar. It is pound. Yeah, pound dollar does tend to have um, a bit of a trending scenario moves and a bit of a consolidation before a quick break towards the downside. <clears throat> One thing as well is that you could actually note I'm not great at chart patterns. I'll do that. I'll put that as a bit of a disclaimer, but a bit of a shoulder, head, and then a shoulder again. So as it breaks that neckline, right, I'm looking for that downward push. So now I'm looking for it to come up, test that neckline to push towards the downside. <clears throat> um, good question there from CISO is, <clears throat> Why don't I analyze my trades on a higher time frame, like on a daily and a weekly? Um, what I tend to realize, oh well, one one approach is that you know trading is a bit customized. It's not one size fits all. Um, you have to do what's comfortable for you. <clears throat> so for me is that if I looked at charts on a daily or the weekly time frame, I don't actually have that patience to sit there and wait for a setup because on a weekly and daily time frame, <clears throat> setups take a long time to happen. Um, and I'm looking at the charts all day, every day, right? Monday to Friday. So because of that, I look at it on H4 time frame, And then after that, I go into the H1. And then during the news, I look at the M1, M5, and M15. But typically I'm on the H4 to do my trend support resistance lines. And then after that on the H1, to look into possible trades, uh, intraday trades. And also another reason is because I find that for most retail traders, um, not everyone has a huge trading account. So <clears throat> if you looked at the daily time frame or the weekly time frame, one is it takes a long time for it to set up. And then two is that um, it, your stop losses and take profit levels could be quite a distance away which will end up having to trade a smaller lot size. Then you wait so long to make that smallest trade doesn't actually seem worthwhile in the long run. So, and, and also I find that retail traders tend to not have that patience to hold on to trades for too long. Uh, so I found that you know, as I'm coaching people, I look at uh, H4 and H1 as a more reasonable time frame, right? Okay, good stuff. <clears throat> Let's look at back to the list of currency pairs. US CAD. <coughs> okay, this is too many lines here. I'm going to clear out some lines. So US CAD has been, right? We looked at the news. We saw weakening in the CAD. We saw strength in the dollar. That's why we saw the CAD shoot up to test that oops, one point, almost 1.30 level. 1.30 is here. Put a line there. But we saw it shoot up with the news from this point to push towards the upside. <coughs> and again, you can see that the CAD is in a bit of a range, right? It's a bit of a range. It's come down, bounce back up, come down, bounce back up. As it goes up, I'm looking for it. I was looking for it to reject to turn towards the downside. This move towards the upside is always was quite straightforward because of the non farm payroll, because of the um, Canadian employment numbers. We saw that push up, but it came very close. It came actually towards that 19th July high before turning towards the downside. So, what should you be looking for? Or what I would be looking for here on the US CAD is for price to track lower, right? I'm not looking to do anything right now. What I need it to do is to trade lower and to break below that point, to break below that 1.2886 level. I would just round it up to say 1.2890 level at about that point there, right? So once it breaks that level, then I would anticipate the US CAD could go towards that 1.28 round number support level 1.28 then I would say 
that if it does break below, I would say, hey, selling opportunity towards the downside, tight stop loss, 25 to 30 pips, take profit about 70 pips towards the downside. A one is to 2.7 risk reward ratio towards the downside on the US CAD. If it breaks below that support level. But hey, we were expecting the US dollar to get stronger. We we're expecting the dollar index to get stronger. If that happens, we could see it bounce up. This is where I like how it's at a support or close to a support level. Look for it to trade lower. If it bounces back up like that, then you have that flexibility to consider both either the upside or the downside. In this case, upside, 80 pips, stop loss, very tight, about 20, 30 pips. I can put it even at 30 pips there. A one is to 2.5, almost one is to 2.5 risk reward ratio towards the upside on the US CAD, right? So I would say be a bit flexible on the US CAD. Look, watch the price action at that 1.29 level. See what, if it's going to break, I could have a selling opportunity. If it bounces off, we have a buying opportunity towards the upside. All right, so far so good. Okay, good stuff. Next one, gold. Gold, gold, gold. All right, so previous analysis on gold, bought it towards upside. It's done that. It came very close to the take profit. It came very close to that 1800 level. Didn't hit. Came back down to test that support level of 1770 again. Right now, I'll take that away. It's almost like a repeat. It's almost like a repeat. I'm looking for this now to bounce back up towards the upside. Straightforward. You know, gold does have that inverse relationship with the dollar, right? Gold does have the inverse relationship with the dollar, but as investors and traders are getting worried about recession, about global recession, gold is likely going to have some strength to push, uh, continue that recent trend towards upside. So I see a question asking for euro dollar. I will get to that after this. Right, so gold again. I'll be looking at stop loss at about that seventeen sixty six level below that support. Take profit close to the eighteen oh five level towards upside. You're looking at a one to two risk reward ratio towards upside for gold. Following on with that upward channel, right? Following on with the upward channel. Um, I'm not sure if it will go all the way towards that point because it needs to break above that resistance level, but we could see that move on gold towards the upside, right? And that's going to be towards that resistance that was tested in July um, this year. <clears throat> super, super. All right, okay. So now looking at um, euro, euro dollar. Okay, I'm just wondering why I've got so many lines here. So let me just zoom out a bit. Check the lines. Okay, so Euro dollar, we do have a line that I'll take this channel away because it's a bit messy. Euro dollar does have an upper limit, an upper limit there. That's the upper limit there, right? Between that 1.03. 86 and 1.0340 level. That's a key resistance level. Key support is at parity. And you can see, but despite all that, Euro has been trading in that horizontal fashion, right? In the wide consolidation between that 1.0250 level, right? 1.0250 level at a, there and the lower level of about 1.015, right? Did break out a little bit, bounce back up, break through a little bit, but in the overall view, it has been trading between 1.015 and 1.025, 
So still likely to remain within this range. <coughs> Pardon me. Still likely to remain within this range on the euro dollar, which I'm not super keen on trading on a horizontal range, but I do know that there are people who like trading in this horizontal fashion. Looking at it on the H1 time frame, you could be looking for <clears throat> very short-term trades and the reaction to that resistance and the reaction to that support level, right? So what you could be looking to do if Euro is going to drop back down, look for a possible bounce towards the upside, look for a possible bounce towards the downside, and then to remain within that range. That would be the, that would require you to <clears throat> manage your trade very closely because it is trading within that 100 pip range. Um, it does, it could break out, it could bounce back in again. Not something I like to do um, with not a very, with quite a narrow range to be trading within. What I'd rather be waiting for is if price could break towards either the upside or the downside. Again, let's guess. Would you think that I would prefer price to break towards the downside or the upside? <coughs> Hey, Noble, yep, I will get to Bitcoin later, shortly. So just bear with me. I'm loving these questions. I'm loving the interactions there. <laughs> John says downside. Tefun says upside. Isaac says upside, downside, downside. Right. So I'm actually looking for Euro dollar um, to break towards the downside. Right? To break towards the downside because look at the trend, big downward move. Um, the Oops. The euro, although the euro dollar has, or the ECB has um, increased rates recently, it is still a lot slower compared to the US. So I am still looking for a downward move, right? I don't think it's going to happen in a hurry. Like Brian says there, very good, Brian. Right? I don't think it's going to happen in a hurry. Possibly not this week. Why? Because if you look at the news for this week, nothing much. Not a lot of news, especially in the euro, for the eurozone. We do have on Wednesday inflation numbers for the US. Could see some strength on the US dollar there. Um, some PPI numbers for the US, pound with the GDP number. Not much for the euro dollar, right? And because of that, I don't think it's going to move towards the downside in a hurry. I actually think that we're going to see it trade within this range, right? We're likely to see it test. Not so much towards the 1.03 um, level, I think. Let me just make it a bit more accurate. I think we could see it test that point again, 1.03 before turning towards the downside. So what I'll be looking for is either to sell down from that point, right? So either to sell down from 1.0110 towards the downside, or I'm looking for it to go up, and then I'll be looking to sell it towards the downside from that 1.03 or 1.029 level towards the downside, right? So I'll, I'm only sitting there watching the euro. Every time it goes up, turns back down from the key resistance levels, I'll look to sell down. If it breaks below this range, I'm still not going to do anything. Unless it breaks below 1.010, then I'll be looking to sell down towards that parity level again. I love asking these questions over the last couple of weeks. How many of you, we've got you know, quite a number of you on this session at this point. Um, do me a favor, let me know. Do you think the euro dollar is going to break below parity? Do you think we're going to see it break below that parity level sustainably as it break and stay below? Not like what we saw here in July where it broke and bounced straight back up. Do you think it's going to go below strongly? Nope, nope, nope. 
Yeah, Rene says no. Is there a Telegram for this platform or just to Zoom? Um, I think it is just on Zoom there, Noble. Richard says yes, 988, very specifically at 9882. I don't see euro breaking. Okay. <laughs> All right, I would differ a little bit from everyone, well, most of you here. Um, I do think it might break, but possibly not soon. Not so soon. Um, not, not this month. Maybe in September, maybe towards the end of the year, but not so soon. So I think that we might see it break, but not so soon. All right. So let's see, you know, something to watch out for, uh, something to put on the watch list and to consider. It is, it really does depend on some catalyst, right? Is the war in Ukraine going to get worse? Oil crisis in Germany, the gas crisis in Germany, many catalysts that could cause that to uh, push towards the downside. So yeah, could go down, but not so soon. All right, so um, let me see what else do we have which other pairs are you asking for i've done euro dollar i've done gold pound yen i look at some of the yen pairs and we jump into cryptocurrencies all right um pound yen right so pound yen previously looking to break towards upside didn't happen but look at it straightforward you can see what happened here big tail hit that's 164 level turn straight back down. Big tail hit close to that 164 level, turn back down. So looks like the pound yen doesn't like that 164 level. And also with the way we were looking at the pound dollar, right? We're looking for that downside move. We're looking for it to move up and turn towards the downside. <coughs> so for the pound yen, what I actually think is that we might see another push towards the downside. I'm looking for a repeat, almost a bit of a repeat there. And you can see that that's forming a bit of a, oops, a bit of a support level there, right? So I'll be a bit more careful with that line because you can see that it tested this level end of July. Again, end of July, early August, tried to break higher. And again here. So what I would be looking for on the pound yen can it break below that 162 or actually 163 level, right? If pound yen can break below this 163 level, next key support will be at about 161. So I would say that <clears throat> if the pound dollar drops, this is all conditional. If the pound dollar drops, then we could see that downside move on a pound yen, oops about a uh, 40 pips stop loss, about 120 pips take profit, a one to three risk reward ratio towards the downside, towards that 1.6150 support level, <coughs> right? So pound yen needs to break below that support level for that downside move. Alrighty, good stuff. Um, Kiwi, I'll look at Aussie yen and Kiwi yen, All right? So Aussie yen pushing towards upside. Why is that pushing up? Primarily because of the Aussie dollar, right? Aussie dollar pushing towards upside, dragging that Aussie yen together with it, pulling it towards upside. Look for a reaction at about that 94 level, right? Just nice, right? At 94 level, same point here, same levels there. We saw that reversal. I wouldn't do anything. Oops. I wouldn't do anything on the Aussie yen yet. Again, I'd rather not trade that smaller move. I'd rather wait for it to break below that 93.60 level for that downside towards that 92.50 level. Right? First target, 92.50 could happen quite quickly, could happen quite quickly. So about 93.30, 93.40, stop loss about 30 pips, take profit at about 60, 70 pips. A one is to two, one is a 2.5 risk reward ratio towards the downside on the pound yen. But 
don't do anything yet. It's right in the middle between that resistance and that support level. Let it react to a level, easier to trade from there. All right, let me see, got a few questions. Um, if we're expecting Fed to raise interest rates so dollar goes up, then there's a risk of recession. Are we expecting dollar to be suppressed, trying to make sense? Um, okay, so good question there. If the Fed increases, or given that they're likely to increase interest rates, we're going to see the dollar strengthen, right? We're going to see the dollar strengthen um, because interest rates in the US is going to be higher than everyone else or in comparison to everyone else across the world. Um, but with the recession, if, and it's also unlikely that the US will be in a recession alone. So what's likely to happen is that we're going to see the dollar strengthen. We're going to see, um, we're likely to see the US go into a recession, maybe. If that does happen, then the rest of the world is likely to go into a recession as well. And because of that, then the dollar is still likely to be stronger than the other currency pairs in relative terms. So because of that, we're going to see not so much a suppressed dollar, but we're going to see a bit more of a volatile dollar um, because slowly, one by one, the other countries will start announcing that they are in a recession. So first, we might see dollar strength, a bit of dollar weakness as you know, other countries are not in a recession yet. Then if they become in a recession, then we see that dollar strength again. So higher volatility expected. Anthony, with a question, do you use multiple time frames to trade and how do you do that? Um, I would say that I do use multiple time frames. I look at H4, char, um, trend, support resistance levels, then the H1 for the reaction to those levels. Uh, so I, I pair it between the H4 and the H1, right? <laughs> but remember, if you're entering a trade based on H4, stay on H4. Um, look at it on, I mean, analyze your trade on H4. If you are looking at it on the H1, then analyze it on H1. Don't try and mix, don't, look, don't enter a trade on H4 and then try and manage it on the H1. It's, it would just be super messy. All righty. Uh, let me see. Questions, questions, questions. <coughs> Brian already selling the pound yen. You could, I mean, you know, that's why I said it's all about um what you're comfortable with, what you're looking, what you're looking towards. Some will get in early, some will get in a little bit later. Just remember to manage your risk there. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it will be uploaded onto the YouTube channel, so just watch out for it. Alright. Mm-hmm. Oh, why is there such a high failure rate? Um, I have no idea about this. See, the thing is a lot of people listening to analysis and actually trading with analysis and actually managing the trade, totally different. It needs a lot of habit to kick in, uh, something that needs a lot of practice, a lot of screen time, a lot of experience as well. So that's why we're here to help you. That's why we're here to help you um, get the odds in your favor. All right, so I, I promised a few of you now, let's look at Bitcoin, All right? Um, what's the best pair to trade on a $100 account size and so what lot size? Um, if you're doing a $100 account size, trade as small as you can, the smallest you can, I would actually say that it depends on where in the world you are, it, based on which pair to trade, because it depends on when you can look at the charts, right? If I tell you that um, if you were in the US and you were going to trade, or rather if you're in the UK and you're going to trade the Aussie dollar might not work to your time zone. Uh, so it depends on where you are to figure out which pairs you should be trading. Okay, and at $100, trade the smallest you can. It's all about building the experience um, with that account size. With Bitcoin, with the cryptocurrencies, what I tend to do is I look at it on a daily time frame, right? So um, on cryptocurrencies, because of that volatility or the previous volatility, I look at it on a daily time frame. Quite straightforward. Previously, I was always saying 23,000. Right now, it's 24,000 as a cap. 
as an upside cap. <coughs> what I think might happen here is that we're likely to see it test, but turn back down again, right? I think we might see it turn back down again before pushing towards the upside. The question most of you have in the back of your mind is likely to be, can Bitcoin hit towards that 28,000, 29,000 level or even the 30,000 level? Quite likely. I do think that it's going to get there, but possibly not straight away. Bitcoin used to be uncorrelated to the other major currency pairs or the markets, but right now it seems to be quite highly correlated to the equity markets and also the to some extent the dollar as well. So just watch out for that. I think that we could see a slow move towards that 30, 28,000, 30,000 level, right? And also I know that as much as I say a slow move, the next moment it could shoot towards upside. So just be extra careful on the cryptocurrencies. <coughs> All right, um, Euro Aussie. So is there a Telegram platform? I'm not sure. Um, I would have to check that. I'll check that and get back. You know, I'm sure they will tell you that in the next session. Let me put a note of that and tell you that in the next session if there's a Telegram platform. All right. If not, there should be. We'll get that. Okay. Um, Euro Aussie. Euro Aussie, take those lines away because you can see that <coughs> back to the H4 time frame. It shot up, came back down. <coughs> Let me clear that lines away. And I'll put in this two points for you, right? So the first one is at 1.4559 or 1.456. The next one is at about that 1.48. 1. I would say 1.48. And it seems like the Euro Aussie is stuck in that range. It's stuck in that range. You all know how I trade now. I'm possibly, I'm looking towards the Euro Aussie, not so much to break towards the upside, I'm looking to see if it can break below this number of one point. I'll make it a nice number. Um, one point four five five zero. If it does break towards that downside, then okay, I'll put this right across. You can see why it's such a key level there, right? If it does break towards the downside. Then the next key level is at 1.4392 or 1.44, right? So you can see daily time frame, big downward move, candle pushing towards the downside. What it needs to do now, it's break below that support level from 1.4629, break below that point towards 1.44. So... Selling opportunity only below that support level. Stop loss. About 50 pips. Take profit. Oops. How do I do this? Okay, go back there. Take profit. Uh, at about almost 100 towards the downside of 1 is to 2 risk reward ratio towards the downside on the Euro Aussie. Right. Uh, why can I watch this webinar and the previous ones? I'm pretty sure it gets uploaded onto the YouTube channel, on the Tickmill YouTube channel. So check that out. Um, if not, then I'll, I'll find out. I'll find out and let you guys know where to rewatch this. But hey, if you're going to rewatch it, make sure you join for the next sessions and all subsequent sessions as well. What happens to Dow Jones when energy prices increase? Well, it depends. Um, why is the energy prices increasing, right? <clears throat> energy prices are dropping right now. Right? Energy prices are dropping right now, um, but we haven't seen too much correlation on the Dow at this point. <clears throat> but <clears throat> if energy prices increase because of conflicts 
because of um, you know further cuts in production, then we're likely to see the Dow move in a similar um, fashion to the energy prices. If it happens for other reasons, then we might see that inverse relationship. So it's not so binary between the Dow and the and energy prices. It's going to be a little bit more um, dependent on the factors causing the change in price. All right. With that, we come to the end of the session. Please let me know in the chat, did you enjoy the session? Was this helpful to you? If there's anything else I can, you know, we can do for the next sessions, I'll be happy to take on that feedback. You're most welcome. Super. Thanks for that, Noble. Fantastic. I do like my fundamental sessions. Thank you all. Excellent. I hope to see you all at the next session again. Take care now. Bye-bye.